The presentation this afternoon is Healthy Families, Healthy Churches. We have talked a little bit about this before in the other presentations because if we need healthy churches, we have to start from the basics, from the home. You have seen how important it is to have our families healthy, especially with the previous presentation. As a matter of fact, the presentation that I did this morning, What Does God Think?, it's approximately 200 slides, so we will not be able to cover it in this, in this camp meeting because it was not the focus. It's just like a beginning of it. But I encourage you, if you have the opportunity to get the presentation, you can go through it yourself with your family and enjoy more, enjoy more blessings with it. But we will continue it, so hopefully we can gather more information on the Sabbath day. So don't miss the continuation of what does God think? So now, talking about the healthy families and the healthy churches, we go to 1 Thessalonians 5.23. 1 Thessalonians 5.23 is the verse in the Bible that gives us the definition of health. What does health mean? And God gave it to us as it says, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we can see right here that the WHO was not the first one defining health. Since 1946 in the medical field we know that the definition of health is the complete uh, equivalent of the three areas of the human being working together as a unity. And God had given it to us. Now, in this case, for the healthy families, healthy churches, I want to make it as realistic also as my other presentation. So I'm going to present to you the problem. And I have be, been using in some of the problems, actually the Word of God to present to us the problems that we have in our society, in our families, and in our churches today. So let's see the first one. The problem is this. Let's see it. <coughs> Reverence is greatly needed in the youth of this age. I am alarmed as I see children and youth of religious parents so heedless of the order and property that should be observed in the house of God. Now, this is God's Word. He is presenting to us the problem we have in our church today. He is not talking, God is not talking about the heathen people. You see that? He's talking about the church. Why? Because He says the problem is where? In our church, it says there, in the house of God. He's talking about us as Seventh-day Adventists. He's not dealing with the hidden people in this paragraph. This is the problem that we have, and it's God Himself telling us what the problem is. The question is, where is the solution? And what is the solution? <clears throat> While God's servants are presenting the words of life, the people, some will be what? <clears throat> Reading. Anything wrong with reading the Bible when someone is preaching? Not really, but... Yes, if you are going to be reading something that is not related to what the preacher is saying, not really focusing in the reading that the preacher is presenting, that is rude. Some people may say, oh, now with the technology, I have my phone, so I have my Bible here. But then in the mind, Satan puts an idea. Oh, go to the internet and go this definition. Okay, you go to the internet and mm, half an hour and the service is not working. You spend 30 minutes looking for it and you didn't find it. You see, the enemy can use anything to divert our minds. And what is the problem? The problem is this. God is not the one that is hard. You see what the point is? The one that is getting the damage is who? Ourselves. Does God need to be in worship time? Does He need it? Does He need to be in church? Does God need to be in church? Does He need to be reverence in church? The one that needs all these things is us. Yet, the ones that will have the problem is us. So we have to see what the problem is in our hearts first, so we can recognize it first. If we cannot recognize the need that we have, how can we ask for forgiveness of sin? Some may be what? 
Some will be reading, others whispering and laughing. Now look what God says. Their eyes are sinning. What? Did you know that your eyes can sin? Who is saying this? God. If God says that our eyes may sin, who am I to say against them? And then if God is saying that our eyes may sin, the next question I have to have in my heart is, Lord, have I been sinning with my eyes in your house? Would you like to have in your record book in heaven that you were sin sinning today with your eyes? What will that mean for me? If in heaven there is a sin said in the book register, Kilman Butin sin today in Iloilo by in the presentation with his eyes. What does that mean? That means I will be blotted out from the book of heaven if I will not ask for forgiveness of that sin. Clear? Is it clear? It's a question. How many of us are sinning and we don't know it? Now remember, God will not charge you for that if you don't know it. But there's one thing that should be clear for us. God cannot. Something that God cannot do. God cannot take away consequences of our sins. Is that clear? I will give you an example. I have a doctor, let's say, a friend of mine, and he is in the medical field, he is doing medical missionary work. But he has a problem. He thinks he can continue his lifestyle of, let's say, eating a lot of fat. And he's vegetarian, so it's not a problem. Now, how many of you know that eating a lot of fat is bad? Many of you? But let's say that my colleague, he thinks it's okay. And he keeps doing it. Now, let me ask you a question. Does God charge him if he believes and he thinks, according to his knowledge, that what he's doing is right, will he be charged for what he's doing? In his innocence and his sincerity, he may not be charged for a sin. Question. Do you think God is going to save him from a heart attack? No way. God cannot do that. So the point is here. Is it good then to be sinning because it doesn't matter, God is not charging me for that? No. The consequences that I have for my sins will be there no matter what. So what's better? Keep sinning and have consequences? Or is it better not to have the consequences and honor God with what we do? Which is better? Which one do we want for our lives? You see the point now? So now let's keep reading. It says, their eyes are sinning by what? Diverting the what? The attention of those around them. I'll give you the example so you can see directly how this applies. You have two children here, three children here, just like them. And they start looking at the back and talking to your eyes. And your eyes go away from the preacher. That's it. We have to be careful, brothers and sisters. This is God speaking. This is not me. We play with the things that we do and we think it's nothing. Sometimes we don't understand the seriousness of the problem that we have. And we have to grow that because we are not children anymore. Big people especially. Children don't know what they are doing. But we do. And we have to be serious. If God said, do not touch the fruit of this tree that is here, what's wrong with eating that fruit? Do you think the fruit that was in the Garden of Eden was poisonous? Do you think that fruit has something wrong in it? Cancer or something like that? No. 
It says that it was pleasing to the eye. It was even tasty. What was the problem? It was disobedience. That's all. So what is it wrong with just looking and not paying attention to the Word of God when someone is preaching? What is wrong with that? Is there anything wrong with laughing and whispering and reading? We think there's nothing wrong. As a matter of fact, if I ask you today that if I as a father tell my Kevin, nine years old today, that if he eats the banana that is on the table, he will get out of my house and I send him out of my house, you would say that I'm a bad father, right? Isn't that what God did with Adam and Eve? Hmm. You start thinking now, huh? Why? Let me tell you, just honestly. There is a topic that I cover in other presentations, and that is, do we really know what love means? Do we really know what love means? We don't. In our society, if you really think, if you really put God into the paper of judgment, we will have judged God and say that He was a bad God. Think about it. In our society. Now, back in our brains, as Christians, we say, no, God is good. But in our brains, if we really think about God, in our back brain, in our unconscious, we are saying he's a bad guy. Study that topic and you will find why I'm saying that. You have to be careful. He says they're children and you should never... What? Ah, no. Sorry. This habit, if allowed to remain unchecked, will grow and influence others. Children and youth should never feel that it is something to be proud of, to be indifferent and careless in meetings where God is worshipped. God sees every irreverent thought or action, and it is registered in the book of heaven. He says, I know thy works. Nothing is hid from his all-searching eye. If you have formed in any degree the habit of inattention and indifference in the house of God, exercise the powers you have to correct it and show that you have self-respect. Practice reverence until it becomes a part of yourself. Now, let's take it apart. In the first section, it says that if you have formed in any degree the habit of inattention, now, let me ask you a question. Any psychologist here, any psychiatrist, psychiatric, you can ask them, you can talk to them, you can go anywhere in the world today and ask any psychologist, any psychiatric doctor, and ask them if inattention is a sin or a disease. You know the answer for that question? Do you know the answer for that question? they will tell you that inattention is a disease. Hmm? Is that clear? Okay. Now let me ask you again. Is it a sin or a disease? Ah, you're thinking now, right? Is it really a sin or a disease? Now let me give you an example so your mind goes even bloating now more. 2009, I was in the U.S. in Tennessee and I was studying medicine. <laughs> My queen was doing a master's degree at Loma Linda University. And she was searching things and we were having a lot of internet access in that time because we were studying and studying and studying. So at one moment I was in the internet and I was searching for news. And it came up in the news one thing. A lady was sharing now in the news, I don't remember if it was NBC News or something, but they were saying, we found the cure for infidelity. The cure for infidelity? So I looked look into that. 
And then there was a pharmacist explaining that they have found a pill, a drug, gamot. And they said that this was now new so the woman can have fidelity in men. They started to explain, medically speaking, that infidel men have a problem in their sexual gene. In the gene, in the chromosomes. So that means infidelity is no more a sin. It's what? A disease. Now let me ask you a question. Read the paragraph again and tell me if God says that inattention is a sin or a disease. What is it? Now let me ask you a question. So you start thinking a little more. What about our children having Ritalin and many other drugs today to take because they have the disease ADHD? They cannot pay attention in church. Are you thinking now a little more? Is it really a disease then? Or a sin? What does God say? If you have the... If you have form in at any degree the... Habit. What is a habit? Something you repeat and repeat and becomes your character. If God is saying that inattention is a problem in your character, is it really a disease? Ah, you're thinking now with your children? You see how tricky Satan has been trying to deceive us with this little fruit. He has many fruits. The Garden of Eden is not new. Has been always the same. He always have a fruit that God said, don't touch it. Don't go that way. Don't believe that lie. But Satan says, no, 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 wait, 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 wait. I'll tell you this way. So you understand it in a different light. Then when you understand it in a different light and you see that, yeah, that's knowledge, that's science. It looks appealing to the eyes and to the knowledge. Good to eat for me to be wiser. God says it's a habit, it is sin, you have to correct it, you cannot continue with it. You have children, have the habit of inattention, you cannot have it. It is a sin, it's a bad habit, it affects your character, it has to be changed. You understand that? Now we're going to go to the root of that problem later so you can see where this all link. But for now, these give you thoughts for learning more, revealing the truth. Now look at what he says. <clears throat> Exercise. This is now God's command. Exercise the powers you have to correct it and show that you have what? Self-respect. God is saying, if a child has, if a person has the problem of inattention, he has no self-respect. You understand that? Okay. Practice what? Reverence. Practice reverence. Until it becomes a part of yourself. Just like anything else. You used to steal? Steal no more. You used to kill? Kill no more. You used to have two wives? Then no, don't have two. Just one. Whatever you have as a habit, bad problems, Correct it. Change it. It has to be part of you. Solution. Where can the problem of reverence in the church could be corrected? You have seen it already. We have talked about it. That's why we emphasize the worship time, morning and evening. It is in the home. It is at the worship time that you are going to correct this problem. 
Now let me tell you. It will not be a powerful thing if I am not able to tell you that it was blessing for me and my family. The reason God of the Word of God is powerful and can influence others and can be a change for other people is that people can see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Meaning, you can see that it's effective. Now, I always tell this to my audience because it's clear and real. Kevin, Kayla, and Carmiel, and even my wife. If you see that Kevin comes and he's polite and he do good things to you, and he gives you the, he, the chair and he sits reverent, and he do this and he do that, never think. That is because of me. Whenever I see my Kevin saying, for example, one day we were in the worship time and I was reading the Bible. And when I finished reading the Bible, because it was, I think it was 3 John, one chapter, very short, we finished. And I said, Amen. And he was staring at me saying, just looking at me. And when, when I saw him, I said, Kevin, what's wrong? And he was staring at me and he said, Daddy, is that all? And I said, yes, I finished. This is a short chapter. We finished worship. We are going to pray now. And he said, Daddy, would you read more for me? If you see that in your child, desiring to have the Bible, the Word of God, to hear it, you think that's for me? Because of me? No, I say, praise God. That's the Holy Spirit working in my son's child. That's not because of me. Now, let me be honest and clear. If you see that Kevin comes and he's not respectful to you, and he tells you something wrong, that's me. That's me. You see the point? Is it clear? All right. So the verse says that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. It is not powerful, this message, because Dr. Botet can do it. No. It is powerful because it, God is doing it in my family. Not because I can do it. The only thing I've been doing is following what I read. Following his guidelines. I have followed it. I have seen it in my children. I still have struggles, even with myself. And I have to battle the same thing day and day after day, like you and everybody else. Don't ever think that I'm perfect. I have no uh, desire that for you to think that I deserve to be here. Oh, you are good and you have to preach to us. No, that's not the way. I do not deserve to be here. I know I have done many things wrong. But the truth that I have, I share with people. Because it is good. The truth is good. I'm the bad one. The truth is good. So don't follow me. Don't look at me either. Look at the good works so you can see that God is able. And at the end, this is what it is. At the end, the whole universe has to say, God is good. Why? Because they can see that He was able to make us what He wants us to be. It says here, Home is a school where all may learn how they are to act in the church. Let there be peace in the home, and there will be peace in the church. So in the home, at the worship time, is when you will see the opportunity to teach your children to behave and appreciate the Word of God and His ways. So when they come to church, it's the same way. Now, don't think that you do it right at church, and you come to church, it will be right. Don't expect that. I can tell you, in my experience, this is what will happen. You are working with your children at home, and it's going well. You see that they are learning to be reverent. You come to church, and the devil will use many missionaries to destroy that, what you have been doing. And you will have to go back and home and straighten the things that are getting out in the place. 
You know how many times I'm in the home and I see how reverent my children can be? I remember with any of them, the three of them, as soon as they were able to sit properly. You know, children may not be able to sit when they are very small, right? Babies. But as soon as they were able to sit and they were able to kneel, I will kneel them for worship time. I will hold their hands and their back, make sure that they are kneeling, and they will kneel with me since that moment up to today. Of course, now they walk, they jump around, and they, they don't need me to hold them. I say, let's pray, and what do everybody do? Go on their knees. Because it is a, a habit. Is it something strange? No. Is it something tedious? No. Now, you have to be careful with little details. For example, when I present about Sabbath and the family, you will see that God says children should not be confound in, within walls the whole day Sabbath. God says we should not put them in these tedious and long prayer meetings if they have to be out. There is a time for the Sabbath where they have to be out. I'll show you from the spirit prophecy. God's guidelines and how the family should run. I will present it to you. I cannot skip that part. It's very important. It's God's command and we have to follow it. <clears throat> but we have to know that there are things we have to consider in the reverence that we have to do during the Sabbath. It doesn't mean that the children are not able to stand for a meeting if they have to. No. I can tell you, if I have to have my children one day whole day in one meeting, I know they can do it by the power of God. Because they have learned. But we have to teach them at home at the worship time. This is the tool God has given it to us. And He said it. The home is a school where all may learn how they are to act in the church. Let there be peace in the home and there will be peace in the church. The world will take knowledge of them that they have been with Jesus and have learned of Him. What an impression in the church would make upon the world if all the members would live Christian lives. If we have Christian lives, then the world may see Jesus in us. The problem is the world cannot see Jesus in us. Now let's, next, let's see the next problem. It says there, if you have the idea that some work greater and holier than this has been entrusted to you, you are under a deception. Now what is this talking about? This is the problem. In the time of LNG White, there were many mothers who thought that go into foreign lands and have missionary life in other countries was the best thing in the world. And then there were some mothers that said, we're going to go to the foreign lands, so we're going to leave the children in our country. And then God has to step in and say, this is not good. So this is the, the scenario. You see the scenario now? Let's see what God says. So let's read it again. If you have the idea that some work greater and holier than this has been entrusted to you, you are under a deception. Under what? Deception. What is a deception? Okay. Is it clear now what we have as a picture? If not, let's keep reading. In neglecting your husband and children for what you suppose to be what? Religious duties. Look what God is saying. Religious Duties. It's not talking about going to this corner of the city and do other things. He's talking about women doing what? Religious duties. What else? Either to attend meetings or to work for others. To give Bible readings. Or to have messages for others, you are doing, you are going directly contrary to the words of inspiration in the instruction of Paul to Titus. Mm -hmm. 
So what this paragraph is saying is that God has to step in one day and say to the mothers, mothers, you think that going to the mission field, doing Bible work, giving Bible studies, doing every kind of religious meeting is a better job than to take care of your husband and your children. Let me tell you that you are going against me. Okay. Now let's continue with this so you can see it more. The religion of Christ never leads a wife and a mother to do as you have done. There are fathers and mothers who long to labor in some foreign mission field. There are many who, many who are active in Christian work outside the home while their own children are strangers to Christ and His love. <coughs> now let me ask you a question. Is this really a problem in our church today? Yes or no? Our children are growing strangers to Christ. Yes, they come to church. But tell me how many of them enjoy sitting and listening to the Word of God. Listening. Paying attention to what the preacher is saying. And not only saying what he's saying, they are wanting more of it. Just in last seminars, a lady came to me for counseling and said, Dr. Boutet, my children don't want to go to church. They don't want to read the Bible. They this and they have learned. I've seen that they have been learning. I put them in a public school and they now they are changed. They learn this and this bad thing, this bad. I'm not going to mention them. Of course, we know that put them in a public school is a no, no, it's not good, right? But this is the reality of our churches, of our world. This is the reality. Children don't. How many of you have heard a child saying, you look at them in the church and you see them looking at the preacher, paying attention? And then the preacher says, for example, and the word, uncle. And he says, daddy, what's uncle? I don't understand what the preacher is saying. I want to know. How many of you have heard that? Have you seen children doing that? Paying attention to the preacher saying, tell me daddy, tell me, explain to me, I want to know. How many of you have seen that? Is that what you want for your children? <clears throat> Do you want your children to desire more of the Word of God? Do you want the children to pay attention to the Word of God and say, give me more? Now let me tell you one thing. This is honesty and this is for you to see the Word of God, not me. Remember, anything good is not for me. That happened to me in the last seminar. My son was looking at the seminar pre presentation and he was paying attention and he asked me, Daddy, tell me what that means. I need to know. Is that me? That's not me. That's the Holy Spirit in my children. I can tell you today, God's plan works. Not because of you, not because of me, but because of God Himself. But if you follow it, you will see the blessings I am seeing in my children and in my wife too. <clears throat> and it says there, the work of winning their children for Christ, many parents trust to the minister or the Sabbath school teacher. A person may ask, when there is a meeting like this, maybe a person may ask, let's say for example, well there is no program for the children. So what are we going to do? Sounds like a good question? Well, the point is this, brothers and sisters. We entrust the life of our children to somebody else. The responsibility is somebody else. But with these seminars, we are teaching you that the responsibility is yours. The fact that children are not able to come in here and pay attention does not mean we are lost, but it's only a reality of our problem today. <clears throat> and we have to learn how to do it. 
And this is one of the things we are trying to do with this seminar. We are trying to learn. You are not going to learn with the first day. You may not learn on the second day. And you may not have heard the whole thing, so you have missed some of the topics, maybe. But the point is, our goal is that you can have an idea of how to do it. This seminar will not give you a degree, I'm a father, a good father now. No. We will be the beginning of your journey. You have to study it. I told you when we were at Uchi Pines and Sister Teresa came, did I tell you? Maybe I skip it. No, I didn't tell you. I told the other group, I think, the other seminar. But when we were at Uchi Pines, one day we had the material that she has, and then we, we thought about the 10 principles of true education. It's a whole series, it's a whole book. The 10 principles of true education is a file, it's a folder. This is the width of it, like this, with a binder, very big one. The biggest binder you can see. And we said, we want to know more about that. And she said, I commit to you. She came to our house every Sunday, one hour, five o'clock in the morning, for one year. And we studied that principles of education. And we went through it all. One year, five o'clock in the morning. Who is willing to do something like that? For the sake of our families, of our children, and our wives. Is a sacrifice? Yes. But we have to do it, we have to do it. I was working as a doctor there in the U.S. And I said, I will do it. Five o'clock in the morning, every Sunday, for one year. And we did it. <clears throat> now, we continue with this. But in doing this, they are neglecting their own highest privilege and most sacred responsibility. Can you see that? We are the one who have to have the control of our children to have them with us any meeting, not somebody else. And leaving that responsibility to somebody else, we are leaving the privilege. Not the privilege. What does God say? The highest privilege. Highest privilege? What human heart can feel for the children, a love deeper or more tender than that of the father or, or the mother. Who is so well acquainted with their needs and their dangers? Who is so well fitted to point the children to Christ as their sin-pardoning Savior? This is the work to which God has appointed parents, appointed them. This is the work. Now, yes, you have not seen that we have any program for children, because if we do so, we will be telling you that it's okay to leave the responsibility to somebody else. Now, I'm not saying that if you have Sabbath school with children and so on, there may be something wrong with it. There may be something wrong with it, yet I will see, because I need to check everything my children are going to be. I never leave my children in the school by themselves. be honest with you, I was in the U.S. One day, I went with my children to the school, the Sabbath school, and guess what? They served merienda to them. I took them out. I teach my children that eating in between meals is wrong. And they have to ask for forgiveness of sin in the evening because they know God is displeased for that. And they will be considered sinners if they do it because they know it really well. I teach them physiology and they know why it's damaging to our body. They know the truth. If they do it, it's sin. And I have to ask them in the evening if they did because they have to ask for forgiveness. And I come to Sabbath school and they give the merienda. If I would not have been there, they would have eaten it, and I would have maybe not known. Nobody can relieve you of your God-given responsibility. No one. <clears throat> Parents who denounce the Canaanites for offering their children to Moloch. You remember the old Israel when they used to burn their children to Moloch? You remember that story? Well, let me tell you that that story repeats itself day after day today. How? Do you want to know? Let's read it. God himself tells us 
how we as parents are offering our children to Molok today. Let's read it. Parents who denounce the Canaanites for offering their children to Molok, what are you doing? You're making a most costly offering to your mammon God. And then, when your children grow up, unloved and unlovely in character, when they show decided impiety and a tendency to infidelity, you blame the faith you profess because it was not able to save them. Is it clear? God is saying with the problem is this. Our youth do not love me. Your children do not love me. They are unlovable. They have bad tempers, bad characters. And you blame the church. You are offering them to Molok. How many times we think that Israel is a bad thing? How ignorant they were. How bad they were. Yet, God says, you are worse than them. You are reaping that which you have sown. The result of your What is the main problem that makes us be sacrificing our children to Molok? Moving our families to places where there are temptations. Is it clear? Okay. You move your families into places of temptation and the ark of God, your glory and defense, you did not consider essential and the Lord has not worked a miracle to deliver the children from temptation. Can you see the importance of this paragraph, brother and sister? God is saying the Shekinah glory that I wanted to place in your baby's forehead, the Shekinah glory that I wanted to have in your homes, my presence in your families is no longer there because you decided to go to the cities instead of to the country. Can you see that? Please study and consider these things because in some of our homes we don't have God. If we ever put our children in places where there are temptations, we are sacrificing them to Molok. That's why I told you, I cannot leave my children alone. No way. That's my greatest responsibility. That's my greatest mission field. My children. Solution. 1 Timothy 2.15 Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing, if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. Then God says, if Christian mothers will present to society children with integrity of character, with firm principles and sound morals, they will have performed the most important of all missionary labor. Which is the greatest mission field God has for us? Mothers. Mothers that can present children with the character of Jesus. Their children, thoroughly educated to take their places in society, are the greatest evidence of Christianity that can be given to the world. Now let me pause for a minute here. What is Satan telling the world and the universe? We cannot be like Jesus. We cannot keep the commandments of God. God is bad. Is unjust. He doesn't love. And God is saying that the greatest evidence against what Satan is saying 
is children with the character of Jesus. If we don't have children with the character of Jesus, what does that mean? We are not participating in this battle proving that God is able. There is no way God can be in judgment today in front of the whole universe and can say, He's just. Why? Because the greatest evidence of Christianity is a well-ordered, well-disciplined family. Do we have it? Here is your work. Parents, to develop the character of your children in harmony with the precept of the Word of God, these works should come what? First. For eternal interests are here involved. The character building of your children is of more importance than... Now, remember I told you the ABC of education is... Farming. Agriculture. That's the ABC. That's the first presentation I gave you. You remember that? Yet, God is saying, even farming, the most important thing is the character of Jesus in your children. More essential than the building of houses to live in or of prosecuting any matter of business or trade. A mother asked me, Dr. Butte, what should I do? I have this business, I have this loan, I have to pay it and my children with a nanai, with a jaya. So you decide. You have the truth here. Step in faith and do what you have to do. Ask the Lord for guidance how you are going to pay that loan and you have to do it. This is God's word. A Christian wise obligation. I have some things to say to you from the Lord. The Lord has a work for you to do. It is not a public work, but a very important one. A work in your own home to be true to your position as a wife and a mother. No other can do this. Your work. The Spirit and the Word of God agree. Remembering this, let us read the word of inspiration from Jesus Christ through Paul to Titus. He is charged to speak the things which become sound doctrine that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, in patience. The aged woman likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given too much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young woman to be sober, to love their husband, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good. The aged woman likewise, that they be in behavior. No, my sister, the Lord has shown me that you are mistaking your duty. Your husband needs you. Your children needs their mother. You have stepped out of the path where Jesus lets the way. He is saying to you, follow me. And he will lead you in your own home duties which are now sadly neglected. The voice of the Lord has not bidden you to separate your interest from that of your husband and children. Your first duty is in the home. The Spirit of the Lord has not given you a work or qualified you to do a work that is contrary to His own word. You have a great work, a sacred, holy calling to exemplify the Christian grace as a faithful wife and mother. To be lovable, patient, kind, yet firm in your home life. To learn right methods and acquire fact for the training of your own little ones. That they may keep the way of the Lord as a humble child of God. Learn in the school of Christ. Where? The school of Christ. Where is the ABC of the school of Christ? Agriculture. As a humble child of God, learn in the school of Christ. Seek constantly to improve your powers to the most perfect, thorough work at home, both by precept and example. In this work, you will have the help of the Lord. But if you ignore your duty as a wife 
and mother, and hold out your hand for the Lord to put another class of work in them, be sure that he will not contradict himself. He points you to the duty you have to do at home. Home missionary work by mother. God does not call mothers away from home missionary work, which will leave their children under the control of influences that are demoralizing, ruinous to the soul. Are not their children in need of missionary labor? Are not her children worth earnest and prayerful effort? Shall she neglect her missionary work for a larger field? Let her try her skill in her own home. Take up her appointed God-given work. If she has utterly failed, it is because she has not had faith or may not have presented the truth and lived the truth as it is in Jesus. Let her, after years of apparent failure, try again other methods, seeking counsel of God, present His promises on your knees before Him. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it will shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. The husband in the open missionary field may receive the honors of men, while the home toiler may receive no earthly credit for her labor. But if she works for the best interests of her family, seeking to fashion their character after the divine motto, the recording angel writes her name as one of the greatest missionaries in the world. Who is the greatest missionary in this world? the mothers. <clears throat> God does not see things as man's finite vision views them. So the problem was the deception of mothers. Solution, we have to recognize that the greatest mission field is your children. Now as husband, we have a part of that. If you, as a husband, don't know how to rule the home, and you don't know how to take care of the home, the woman will be forced to do so. Therefore, men have a part of this. Yes or not? Yes. And we see it when... We see that. You remember we were talking about irreverence, we were talking about inattention, we were talking about many things, and we know one thing. We have always thought that when we talk about spiritual things, it has nothing to do with our bodies. And that is not true. Let me prove it to you from the Word of God and from the science point of view, so you can see. The problem is this, in nine cases out of ten, how much is that? Ninety percent. God is saying ninety percent of the times, what happened? The indisposition of children can be traced to some indulgence of the... What? Perverted appetite. How many times? 90% of the time. So you're telling me with the Word of God that in our world, the problem that we are seeing in the indisposition of children... What is indisposition? What is indisposition? Huh? No. Talking about indisposition will be this. Indisposition will be this. Just to see an example, you can see it practically. You said to your child... For example, to my Kevin, Kevin, would you go and wash the dishes? And he does this. Is that a good disposition? It's an indisposition. When they are in church, are they reverent? 
dear irreverent. Is that good disposition? No, that's in disposition. You ask the children, respect the adults, talk to them. Is that a good disposition? That's in disposition. 90% of the time, the indisposition of children, the negativity, the wrong things, the disobedience, the whole problem is because of what? The perverted appetite. Do we need a change on that? If God is saying that 90% of the problem is in your stomach habits, do we need a change? Do we need? I'm going to show you a clip, so pay attention. This is an American, so he speaks worse than me. Because I'm not American. I, 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 well, I was not born in the U.S. And I speak English because my native language is Spanish, so I had to learn English. So you have to pay attention to him. This is Dr. Russell Blaylock. If you ever want, you can go online. You just type his name and you will see. He's a neurosurgeon. Retired already. He works in the research areas now. But he used to be one of the greatest neurosurgeons in the U.S. when he used to do surgeries. He had a problem. He lost his father and his mother from Parkinson's disease. What a contradiction. He's a neurosurgeon. The best neurosurgeons maybe in the U.S. or one of the best. And yet, his father and his mother died from Parkinson's disease. Why? He didn't know. He started searching. He knew. He thought he knew everything. And he started searching and he found many things. And now he's revealing things. Of, he's opening boxes of lying things. And one of them is this. So listen to it. It's missing. And it only takes about two weeks of deficiency to produce that. Now, one of the first hints that there might be a connection between what you eat and your behavior was by uh, Dr. George Gould back in 1910. So we see this is not completely new. And then we see in 1935, it was found that hypoglycemia, low blood sugar, could mimic many of the serious neurological and psychological conditions like anxiety, neurosis, hysteria, neurasthenia, and even psychosis could be imitated by people becoming hypoglycemic. And then in 1973, Dr. Wendell and Beebe found that there was a 74% incidence of hypoglycemia in people who had schizophrenia, the type of schizophrenia associated with anxiety. In other words, a very hyperactive schizophrenic. Almost three quarters of them, or three quarters of them, were uh, hypoglycemic. And we'll see what that does. And we're seeing a strong connection between sugar metabolism, carbohydrate metabolism in the brain, and various psychological conditions. For instance, they found 60% of the members of families that have hyperactive children either have diabetes, obesity, alcoholism, all three, which are all sugar consumption problems. So there's a very strong correlation there in hyperactivity in children. More research indicated that 75% of all prisoners were hyperactive as children. So it's taking it back all the way to this childhood that was programming that child for criminal behavior later in their life. Now why would sugar have such a profound influence on brain function and psychological function? Well, when the sugar is in excess, it produces excess release of insulin. When insulin is released, you get hypoglycemia if it's excessive. That is, the blood sugar falls. When the blood sugar falls, it does two things. One, your body is trying to get that blood sugar back up because it needs that sugar for its energy metabolism. So it stimulates the adrenal gland to release two hormones. These are called epinephrine and norepinephrine. These are the hormones that make you jittery and nervous when your blood sugar falls. So if these hormones are stimulating the brain to increase activity. Also, when the brain becomes hypoglycemic, it releases one of its neurotransmitters called glutamate. Glutamate is the primary neurotransmitter for excitability. So it is the primary thing that turns the brain's activity into high gear. So both of these, the norepinephrine, epinephrine, and glutamate are producing a state of hyperactivity. 
Now let's look at the effect of crime and nutrition. Uh, this was done by Dr. Stitt, who did, was a probation officer in uh, Ohio, who did some uh, research on the effect of uh, diet and uh, probation violators. And what she found is that those who remained on a bad diet, a lot of sugar, a lot of junk food, a lot of food additives like MSG, NutraSweet, these things, when they stayed on that, 56% of them ended up violating their probation uh, by committing some antisocial act robbery, violence, etc. But if they were switched to a healthy diet, only 8% ever broke their probation. So there was a tremendous change in their behavior just by changing their diet. And these are, are problems. When they looked at narcotic abuse, they found the same thing. Is that those who maintain the bad diet, the high sugar diet, junk food diet, 37% of them continued to use narcotics while they were on probation. Whereas those who were switched to the better diet, only 13% of them violated their probation by using narcotics. So it's a rather profound effect, it's not a minor effect. They also coincidentally found there was a dramatic reduction in suicides. So there's a strong correlation between this high sugar, high junk food diet and suicidal behavior. Now the Alabama prison system also did a similar study. They changed the diet of some of the prisoners and used the others to control. They found that there was a 42% reduction in criminal events when they changed these criminals' diet. And that there was a 61% reduction in antisocial behavior at one year. Another example of the profound effect of diet. Now just to give you a personal case, this is Raymond. Uh, Raymond was arrested for uh, assaulting his girlfriend. He actually tried to kill her. Uh, they were just arguing over something that was non-consequential, uh, just, just silly. But he threw into a rage, pulled his 357 Magnum, grabbed her, and put it up to her head to shoot her, and she knocked it out of the way with her hand and he shot through her hand. Uh, she wouldn't file charges against him, but the state charged him with firing a, a, a weapon inside the city limits, so they arrested him. Well, uh, Dr. Stitt went back and looked at his history, and what she found out is that age four, his mother said he had these weak spells when he was playing, and he gets so weak he couldn't hardly play. <coughs> So let's gather the information. God said 90% of the cases are related to what? Perverted appetite. Now you remember we were seeing it all over the presentation. The problem is inattention. Do you think children today enjoy being kind to others? Or they enjoy violent behavior. Are they always playing kind things? I see them even in the last seminar building swords with bamboo. And I saw them using them. And I had to turn my children's eye from that. Psalm 103, 1 says, I will place no wicked thing before mine eyes. One day a study was done with the mirror neurons in the brain and they found that if a monkey sees you eating a banana and you give them the banana to eat, the brain, when they put the wires to see which neurons are working at the moment he's eating the banana, they pointed them and they found that in the frontal lobe area there are mirror neurons. That's how they call it. Meaning, if he eats the banana and the person eats the banana, the same neurons fire. And they did the study giving the banana to the person and putting the monkey not eating banana, just watching the person eat the banana and the same neurons in the monkey were firing even though he was not eating the banana. What does that mean? This is what we call vicarious mental participation. You are inside of that act, even though you did not do it.
vicarious mental participation. If you ever sit wanting to see what is going on and is bad, you are inside of it. Any event that has an emotion linked to it, and almost everything has an emotion linked to it, if you see it, you are chargeable of that event. Does diet affect our behavior? Which was the item of food they were talking about? The main one? Sugar. Do we want healthy churches? Do we need healthy churches? Do we want healthy homes? We need healthy homes. But it's not going to happen if we continue in the same problem. We have to come out and go into the true education. And that means parents first, especially husbands. Because when God comes, He's not going to say, Mothers, come. Where's your husband? And your children. No, that's not what God is going to say. He's going to call me and say, Where's your children and your wife? That's what He's going to say. And what should I be able to answer? Solution. Perhaps it is an exposure to cold, want of fresh air, irregularity in eating, improper clothing, and all the parent need to do is to remove the cause and secure for the children a period of quiet and rest or abstinence from a short time from what? Some people say that you should never allow a child not to eat. What is God saying? If it's needed, I'm not saying now put your children to fast and don't give them food. But if it's needed for a period, you have to do it. it needs to be done, you can do it. Now you have to know how to do it. You have to learn. As parents, we have to know how to handle that. Because God is not saying, kill your children or damage your children. He's saying, use that because it needs to be done. And we'll cover a little more of that in the next part of the presentation. What does God think? Hopefully on Sabbath we will cover that. This is it. We have a need. We need to do it. He says here, an agreeable bath or the, of the proper temperature will remove impurities from the skin and the unpleasant symptoms may soon disappear. There are many solutions. God has a solution for our problems. We have seen some. We cannot cover them all in this presentation. But at least you have an opening of eyes. We as parents have a great responsibility in this problem. But God has a solution for it. I have seen it. I have experienced it. You can have it also. Get on board and enjoy the blessing of the Lord. If you want that for your family, Please, pray with me. Heavenly Father, we have touched only a little bit of the need that we have as parents, especially husbands, fathers of the home, to keep our families healthy, our churches healthy, that we may be elders that can lead the churches in the proper way. Lord, guide us. Help us with your Holy Spirit that we may see the need and see the solution and apply it in our home. That our homes may be the greatest evidence that you are able to change, to make us holy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.